There have been a handful of revolutions in medicine that have transformed the world. Antibiotics, vaccination, the Siamese twins of surgery and anesthesia, the ability to look inside your body without opening it up, non-invasive imaging. These have transformed the world so much that probably most of us in this room wouldn't even exist had it not been for these prior discoveries. We're living in an age where the next medical revolution is now beginning. And this is stem cell medicine. This is now transitioning from a point where 30 years ago there was a handful of, of us who were trying to figure out how bodies develop into what is becoming quickly a very important field of medical practice. The kind of diseases that we're interested in span all parts of the body spinal cord injury, kidney disease, cerebral palsy, blindness, burns, cancer, cardiac failure, osteoporosis, the list goes on and on and on. And what's great about this list is that no doctor has ever cured anybody. All the doctors do is they let the cells of your body do what they're supposed to do. Vaccination works by getting the cells of the immune system to do what they're supposed to do. Stem cell medicine works because it's enabling cells to do the job that they're supposed to do. We have long successes in this with bone marrow transplants. Bone marrow transplants, what has been learned there, has led the way to new insights into how to treat autoimmune diseases with great successes at clinics such as those at Northwestern University where people with lupus and people with multiple sclerosis and people with type 1 diabetes are given new hope and better lives. Burns. The work on burns has led to new treatments for corneal burns, right? When you're in a fire, the stem cells of your cornea are very, very sensitive to heat. They can be lost. There are people now who had been in fires 18 years previously who had stem cells taken out of one eye, transferred to the other eye, and they get their vision back and trachea replacement, one of my favorites, one of the examples of how science is supposed to work. There was a woman in Spain who had a severely damaged trachea, very constricted. So bad that probably she would need a lung transplant. But what the surgeons in Spain did was something different. They took some tissue from her normal trachea and they sent it to a laboratory in England. And that laboratory in England grew up the cells from the trachea. And then a laboratory in Italy that was taking tracheas from cadavers and taking them and stripping all the cells off of them and now making this decellularized tissue construct sent that to the team in England who threw the woman's own stem cells on this tissue, sent it back to the surgeons in Spain who inserted it. And within a couple of weeks, this woman had nearly normal lung function. This is what stem cell medicine is enabling. And I want to tell you about some of the work that's going on here in Rochester. I'm going to talk particularly about work with my faculty colleagues, Margot meyer Prochelle and Chris Prochel, with whom I've been working for about 20 years now. I'll tell you first about our work on repairing spinal cord injury, work that's done together with colleagues Stephen and Jeanette Davies out of the University of Colorado in Denver. There's a lot of interest in using cell transplantation to repair spinal cord injury. And people use a lot of different cell types. So I've just got to introduce you to a couple of names. So you've all heard about stem cells. Little secret. Stem cells are really boring. See, stem cells have one job. And that is to make another kind of cell called progenitor cells. Progenitor cells are the ones that are going to make all the cell types of your body. They're the ones that do the heavy lifting of tissue building and tissue repair. And, and we do a lot of work on discovering different kinds of progenitor cells. And in the nervous system, the kind of cells that we're particularly interested in 
are progenitor cells that make the supporting cells of the nervous system, not the nerve cells, but the supporting cells, two kinds of cells, one called an oligodendrocyte, which makes the insulating sheaths that wrap all of your axons in the nervous system, and different kinds of astrocytes that are the major support cell in the nervous system are important for many functions. What we've discovered is that if we take a very specific progenitor cell and we transplant it after first turning it into a very specific kind of astrocyte, we get spectacular levels of repair. Now, I know that these look like abstract paintings, but let me tell you what they mean. In the top one, what we've done is we've cut the spinal cord and we've transplanted the progenitor cells into the lesion area. And the green lines are nerve cells that are trying to grow back across, and they just don't get very far. In the bottom one, what we've done is we've turned these progenitor cells into a very specific kind of astrocyte. And if we do that, they grow across, they grow through the lesion, they grow back into normal tissue. And a lot of people do things like that. In fact, one of the problems we have in this field is we have many, many people who have discovered cells that work to promote repair. But what very few people do is to do heads-up comparisons and ask if any particular cell type is better, which is something we do extensively. Now, this kind of growing of cells in the nervous system is scientifically interesting, but it's not the goal. The goal is to regain movement. And that's what I'm showing you in this graph here. The way we study movement is the animals are trained to walk across the grid. They have to put their feet in the right place. If we cut the spinal cord, they start making a lot of mistakes. If we don't do any transplant, they don't get any better. If we transplant the progenitor cells, they don't get any better. If they transplant the wrong kind of astrocyte, they don't get any better. But if we transplant this one specific kind of astrocyte, we get initial protection, and the animals get so much better that after four weeks, we can't tell the difference between them and animals that never had an injury. This work has gone far enough that we have the human astrocytes that do this. It's also gone far enough so that this week, Chris Prochelle and Stephen and Jeanette Davies are presenting at the Society for Neuroscience meetings data showing that we can delay transplants by 10 days, by a month, by several months. The reason that's important is because we have about 10,000 new injuries in spinal cord in the United States every year, but the estimates from the Christopher Reeve Foundation are that there are anywhere from a half a million to a million people with chronic spinal cord injury. That's our goal, is to be able to treat spinal cord injury. To do that, you have to discover cells that are gonna cause recovery of function with long delay after transplantation. Okay, that's transplanting cells. What about recruiting the body's own cells for repair? A lot of people are working on this. Great work here in the Department of Orthopedics where people have discovered that an existing drug called Forteo, which is a mimic of a hormone called parathyroid hormone, recruits the bone-forming stem cells out of the bone marrow and looks like it can be used to enhance fracture repair. An existing drug, take it, use it in a new way to try and enhance fracture repair by recruiting stem cells. Work that we're doing suggests that when we transplant these astrocytes, one of the things that they do is recruit the stem and progenitor cells of the body itself to help in the repair process. And that's the kind of work that most people hear about and think about when they think about stem cell medicine. But there's a whole other side to this, which is what happens when bad things happen to good cells? It's estimated that neurological disorders disable 14 million children in the United States. Why? How does this happen? Through work we've been doing and other labs have been doing, we've come to learn that many developmental maladies are caused by dysfunction of stem cells and progenitor cells. One of the ones that we're particularly interested in is one raised by the challenge of toxicology. We have about 80 to 150,000 registered chemicals that never existed in, in history before World War II, and we're exposed to them. We don't know what they do. We don't know if they're dangerous. We don't know how to study it. And it's beginning to look as though 
stem cell biology is going to give us a new way to do that. That's important because it's becoming clear that these kinds of toxicants contribute to many diseases. Risk factors for multiple sclerosis, autism, motor neuron disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, a list that grows and grows. So what do we find when we do these experiments? We take progenitor cells, we take stem cells, we take different cell types, we put them in a tissue culture dish, and we look at what happens when you put these environmental chemicals on them. And here's an example of the kind of things we see. The top slide is the sensitivity of astrocytes, looking at their sensitivity to methylmercury. They are killed by about 100 parts per billion methylmercury, which is a lot of mercury. Same for neurons, actually the same for stem cells. But when we look at the progenitor cells, they're killed by five parts per billion methylmercury. Now, I don't want to change your eating habits, but five parts per billion methylmercury is the level of methylmercury you have in your bloodstream if you eat tuna fish or swordfish three times a week. And the brain concentrates, the human brain concentrates mercury five to sevenfold over the bloodstream. So these are serious environmental levels of exposure. Not only that, lower levels of exposure make you sensitive to other kinds of insults. So here's a graph from an experiment we use in the laboratory to try and model newborn hypoxic birth injury in a tissue culture dish. This is an oxygen deprivation injury. So we give a level of oxygen and glucose deprivation that doesn't kill many cells, a level of methylmercury that doesn't kill many cells, but look at what happens when we put them together. Massive cell death. Do these environmental toxicants make other kinds of insults worse? The path to better cancer treatment also goes through stem cell biology. First, let me start out with the toxicology part of this. Our cancer treatments are barbaric. They are poisons. They kill the normal cells of the body. We're particularly interested in that in the nervous system because there are a lot of unexplained neurological complications of treatment with systemic chemotherapy. In breast cancer, where this is the best studied, it is estimated that a third of the women who receive high-dose chemotherapy and survive for two years or more will have readily detectable cognitive impairment. Many more will report changes in self-report studies. Why? What is going on? Well, it turns out, and what we've discovered, is that the normal progenitor cells of the brain are more sensitive to chemotherapeutic agents than the cancer cells are. Well, we make that discovery. Now we can find ways of blocking that. We can look at whether we can find drugs that block it. But how are we going to study that? You know, on the mouse, we can give a drug, then we sacrifice the mouse, we take its brain out. You don't do that with people. So we need ways of studying this non-invasively where we can do the same test in a mouse as in an adult. And uh, my colleague, Margot Meyer-Porchel, had a brilliant idea on how to do this. What we do is we stick an electrode on the ear, an electrode on the neck, and a ground electrode somewhere else on the body. We give a click in the ear, and we measure the speed with which information travels from the ear back to the brainstem. It's called the auditory brainstem response, widely, widely used in analysis of people of all ages. So here's an experiment where what we did was we injected 5-fluorouracil three times into the gut of an animal, not into the brain, into the gut, and we followed the animal over time looking at the speed of this transmission at out to 56 days. So this is the controls. The bars are all below this line, which is a good thing. We give 5-fluorouracil, now the impulses travel more slowly, reflecting the damage being done to the central nervous system. And our first protective agent, neuroprotectant 1, protects against this. It's possible to discover protective agents. But it would be better to do a better job of treating cancer itself. And here we run into the discovery that stem cells have evil twins that have gone over to the dark side. Cancers have their own cancer stem cells. These cells can be rare. They can be hard to kill. They're very changeable. But if you don't get rid of them, you don't get rid of the cancer. Here's how it works. Easy to understand metaphor. You have a weed in your garden. Come along with a lawnmower. Cut off the top of the weed. Leave the root. That's the cancer stem cells. And you all know what happens. 
So can you get at the root of the cancer? Well, my colleague Craig Jordan at the University of Rochester has been studying that in the leukemias, and his work has gone so far that they have a drug that enables them to kill leukemia stem cells without killing the normal stem cells of the bone marrow. They've taken that work so far, it's now begun clinical trials in Europe. We and others are doing similar kinds of work in respect to brain tumors, the kind of tumor in which we're particularly interested. Last point I want to make is that stem cell medicine can play a critical role in our problems with trying to reduce healthcare costs. These kinds of diseases that people in stem cell medicine are interested in represent an enormous burden on our economic and healthcare systems. It is estimated that the annual costs of care for chronic disease in the United States are in the range of 400 to 500 billion dollars. Impacting on these diseases, treating these diseases, would be the best way to reduce healthcare costs. Very cost effective. To give an example of how cost effective this would be, the estimated costs for treating type 1 diabetes every year in this country alone are about $15 billion. The entire annual budget for the entire National Institutes of Health is only about $30 billion a year. That's the kind of impact we could have. So TED Talks are supposed to have a call to action. And if I had a call for action, it would be to say to the president, the senators, the congressmen, the governors, here is a chance to fix this unending, gaping hole in the economy. We have low-hanging fruit that we're going to pick off, just as the vaccines enabled us to pick off smallpox and polio and many other important diseases. There's going to be some easy hits. There's going to be some hard ones. But the easy ones we get are going to be transformative. It's a win, 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 win in every direction. New discoveries, new companies, new lives back for people with very serious afflictions. So it's time to do that. And President Obama, Senator Reid, Congressman Boehner, Congressman Kanner, if you're listening, now is the time to invest in us. Thank you.